This video is from C2.2 on neural signaling. It's all standard level content and we are going to take a deep dive into transmission along neurons. Neurons are specially adapted cells that can carry electrical impulses, and we call that a nerve impulse. So nerve impulses are electrical signals that can be passed between two cells. They can go between a neuron to another neuron or a neuron to a muscle or a neuron in a gland, lots of things. But in general, we're gonna categorize these nerve impulses into two groups. So we have transmission along neurons, so how things go from one end of the cell to the other, and then how nerve signals pass between neurons. Now, this will all be done in another video. This video focuses mainly on nerve impulses along a neuron. Throughout this video, you're going to hear me refer, refer to this term membrane potential quite a lot. And when we think about membrane potential, I really need you to associate that with voltage, okay? So voltage is an imbalance of charges on either side of the membrane. And so when we think about an imbalance of charges, that's going to give us either a relatively positive charge or a relatively negative charge. Okay, now at rest, the inside of our neurons needs to be relatively negative at about negative 70 millivolts. That's our resting membrane potential. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to blow up part of this neuron here. All right, so I'll show you just kind of which section. If I take a little tiny bit like right here and I blow it up and we can take a closer look at it, we're going to find that embedded in that membrane is a protein pump called the sodium potassium pump. And what the sodium potassium pump does is that it establishes resting potential by actively transporting sodium to the outside and potassium to the inside. Okay, so now when I say active transport, what we mean is that it requires ATP and we are generating a concentration gradient. Okay, so sodium potassium pump is using ATP to actively pump sodium ions to the outside and potassium ions to the inside of the cell. And this is what our cells are going to look like at rest, okay? So at rest, what I should notice is that the sodium ions are on the outside, the potassium ions are on the inside, that the relative voltage of the cell is negative, again, to the tune of about negative 70 millivolts, and that is all established via active transport by the sodium potassium pump. So let's see if we can plot this out visually speaking. Okay, so I've got a graph here and we'll track how potential difference, that's my voltage, right, millivolts, changes over time. Now, at rest, our cell is relatively negative. So we said at about negative 70, that's our resting potential. And at rest, due to that sodium and potassium pump, um, these sodium ions, let me get my key going out here, my, these sodium ions are on the outside of the cell and the potassium ions are on the inside of the cell. And that is at rest. Again, at this point, my cell has a relatively negative voltage on the inside. During a nerve transmission, what's going to happen is that sodium ions are going to move into the cell. And because sodium ions are positive ions, you can guess that their movement into the cell is going to cause that cell to become relatively positive in its voltage. And that is something called depolarization. So in depolarization, this is the membrane potential going from negative to positive. Okay, now again, due to the movement of ions. At this point, this positive voltage is going to cause changes in some of the channel proteins in this membrane, and it's going to result in these potassium ions leaving the cell. 
Okay, well, you can imagine how if I'm losing a positive ion, that's going to cause my voltage to return back to a relatively negative voltage. This is something called repolarization, so membrane potential going back down to resting potential. Now, we have a slight problem, <laughs> which is that things are in the opposite uh, spot that they should be. We know that at rest, our cells should be negative, check, but we should have sodium ions on the outside and potassium ions on the inside. So that is actually the job of the sodium potassium pump that we just learned about, to pump the sodium ions to the outside and the potassium ions on the inside to restore that resting potential. And so now after this nerve impulse, I am back at the resting potential. So here are all of these things in text that we just showed in uh, a visual. So the steps look like this. Voltage gated sodium ion channels are going to open. So these are transmembrane proteins located in there. And when we say voltage gated, that means that they are going to open and close based on voltage. So when there is a stimulus that is strong enough, it is going to open the sodium ion channels. Remember, there's a high concentration of sodium ions on the outside of the cell due to the pumping by the sodium potassium pump. So when those channels open, those sodium ions are going to diffuse into the cell. That's just facilitated diffusion. That's passive movement. And that's going to cause depolarization. So the cell is going to go from a relatively negative voltage to a relatively positive voltage on the inside. That positive voltage causes voltage-gated sodium ion channels to close. Okay, so these guys are going to close. And it causes voltage-gated potassium ion channels to open. So since there is a high concentration of potassium ions on the inside of the cell already, once those gated ion channels open, potassium ions will diffuse out of the cell and that will cause repolarization. So we'll go back from positive voltage to the negative voltage that our cell is at during rest. Okay, so positive to negative. And then the last thing that we showed was that sodium potassium pump re-establishing resting potential by actively pumping the sodium ions out and the potassium ions in. So if we're asked anything about like what's the role in ATP or of ATP in nerve transmission along neurons, we can be thinking about the sodium potassium pump. Otherwise, it's really the change in voltage here that's opening up these ion channels and propagating that nerve impulse along the axon of the nerve fiber. Now these nerve impulses along a neuron are what we call self-propagating. That means once you get them started, it's like a string of dominoes, okay? And those events will continue to move along the axon. So when I say axon, I just want to be clear. Um, nerve transmissions only happen in one direction. They start at the dendrites, okay? And it moves along the axon and it will end at this place called the axon terminal. So we're really only looking at nerve transmission happening in this direction. So what happens when we get that initial impulse that opens up those sodium ion channels is that positive voltage. And that positive voltage in one part opens up ion channels in the next part, so ions come in and it becomes positive, which opens up ion channels in the next part, so it becomes positive, so on and so forth. And so this wave of positive voltage is going to travel down this axon. So all of this will happen here. And then once this section of the neuron is done with this part, okay, and it's returning back to its resting potential, then it moves on to the next part, okay, and causes this wave of positive voltage. And now this part goes back to being negative. And now the next part starts to open up and become positive. And you can start to see how this self-propagating wave makes its way all the way down along this nerve fiber.
Now the average speed for this nerve impulse is about one meter per second, which sounds really fast, but in terms of nerves, it's actually not as fast as it could be. And there are several adaptations that organisms have for speeding this up. One is just to increase the diameter. This is pure Ohm's law for any of you um, in physics. When you increase the diameter, you decrease the resistance to flow. And so that electrical impulse will travel faster along this um, neuron. The other really cool evolutionary adaptation is something called myelination. And myelination looks a little bit like this. It results in a structure called a myelin sheath. Okay, so that's what's in blue here. And if you look at um, this myelin sheath, okay, you'll notice that it's actually made up of several cells, okay? And each of these cells is called a Schwann cell, it's kind of cool. And in between each cell, you have a little space called a node. So the names of the cells aren't super important, but I do wanna point out that they are separated by nodes. And this is um, a great setup for something called saltatory conduction. And this only applies to myelinated neurons. Unmyelinated neurons can't do this. So in unmyelinated neurons, you have to have sodium in, out, in, out, in, out, in, out, in, out, in, out, all along the axon. What these Schwann cells of the myelin sheath do is they insulate that electrical charge. So instead of that electrical charge escaping and then having to be put back in, it jumps from node to node. So what ends up happening is that we only need to do sodium in and out, potassium in and out, at the nodes instead of all along the axon. So that impulse jumps from node to node insulated by the cells of the myelin sheath. Not only does that decrease the energy requirements, we don't need as much ATP to power the sodium potassium pump, but it greatly increases the speed. So we're talking about going from one meter per second to 10 meters per second. And wow, you can really think about the implications in terms of like response times and messaging and how that might be an evolutionary advantage. But again, only with myelinated neurons. And that's going to be a property that not every organism has. Um, you have them, but we'll take a closer look at those in some future topics.